Okay, so now for uh, now for something completely different. The um, Center for Design and Geopolitics is was conceived um, in conversations with Larry and Ramesh as a think tank that would extend the uh, the work that happens uh, at Cal IT and around Cal IT into some new in, into new venues. And to think about the the impact of the work that goes on here and the work that will continue to go on here um, as contributing directly to a new kind of of policy conversation. I'm sorry, I'm losing my signal here from the computer for some reason. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, it, was, it was thought by, the er, by some of the early explorers uh, that, uh, based on initial reports uh, from the uh, Russians and Spanish explorers, that California was an island. And for many centuries, the California showed, uh, um, was, uh, was shown in maps of the region uh, as an island um, as, late as, the, as late as the 17th century. And to some extent, um, we could hypothesize that the early geographers uh, had it right and that California uh, and California's role in thinking of in, in, its, in impacting the political future of technology um, is one that uh, has a kind of special position um, among other among other geographies. The, let me just say that the the, pre, the the primary interest for the center is in, in terms of the way we think about policy is in presuming that the planetary scale computing infrastructures that we are continuing to develop have two have two key effects. One is to both essentially redefine and distort the traditional political jurisdictional geographies that we have been inherited from the era after the Treaty of Westphalia and also produce new forms of political geography and jurisdiction in their own image. So part of the role of the center and part of the speculative uh, agenda for the center is to, cons is, to, is to first account for the transformations as they take place, but also to imagine what, in fact, what comes next and how it is that we can model and understand those. And we do this, again, by focusing on, um, first I'm focusing on California um, and taking what we see as essentially California as a first order, as, as itself, the entire polity of the California as, as a design problem. So in the development of the scenarios um, that we would want to, 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 see about, to, to think about, the question of what kind of future, what kind of sovereign citizen, what kind of political geographies, and ultimately who is the user of these new infrastructures and what rights and responsibilities these infrastructures command to them um, drives a lot of the questions. We also think about, in a sense, that the, that the populations that we're conceiving of and the populations we're working towards are ones that are, that are unstable. It's estimated that by the year 2050, something, something of the order of 650 million people will migrate from one country to, to another. And when we think about the human species, not only now that we, more people live in cities and don't live in cities, but also that such a huge percentage live in a, it will, be, will, will be migrants. The question of what political geography can contain, what it can provide for, what it can guarantee, what it can't guarantee, are questions that are opened up again in some important and provocative kinds of ways. The fact that IT has such a, uh, does and have such an important role in providing for the possibility of these mobilities makes the question of technology policy and essentially a kind of projective geography, as we see it, part of the same problem. So we look at, we look at, um, uh, you know, begin, we, we begin with sort of, uh, projecting uh, exponential growth from Moore's law, but also Moore's law type of formations, not only with computing technologies, but also with uh, energy technologies and presumptions of, of increases in efficiency with energy technologies, such that discussions around smart grids and, and, and so forth really become questions not only about the distribution of information or the distribution of electrons, but introductions of infor uh, information and el as electrons as a common infrastructural problem, whereby the continuing development of an electronics of an of a, of a electricity grid and of an internet grid become intertwined. We also look at issues of eco-governance, as, as I think should be, clean, should be clear. And you know, we, can, we can hypothesize that by tw 2025, if we were going to try to reduce 
carbon parts back to 300 and 350 parts per million, that we're looking at an or, a problem of trying to replace something like 15 terawatts um, of, of energy, which is an enormous challenge to not only to as a technological challenge, but as we see it as a challenge in terms of governance. How do you govern an ecology? How do you govern the production and distribution of energy? We simply don't know. Um, you know I was thinking we, one of the, the things that we were looking at recently was the, the volcano explosion um, in Europe um, which, uh, and the way in which it shut down the mobility there as well. If this had been much more severe, the questions of, sort of, a ma of mass migration, say, from Iceland, would have been an, would have been a tremendous uh, tremendously difficult political issue of how to absorb this number of people, not one that we really have the infrastructures in place to how to deal with. That is to say that we don't know how to make the cities that we know we need how to make. So, one of the ways in which we sort of break down this problem um, is to think about the the structure. This in terms of a sort of uh, the uh, uh, of, of a kind of stack. And to think about and the, the emerging infrastructure of planetary scale computation as happening at multiple territory at multiple territorial scales. We also move, we also think about this from the presumption of the of uh, Paul Virilio's axiom, axiom that the invention of any new technology is also simultaneously the invention of a new kind of accident. And that the and that the, the, the continuing development of this infrastructure constitutes its own form, kinds of accidents that themselves may be the more more productive of. Uh, uh, forms. So the stack breaks down rather simply of a cloud computing or planetary computation at a global scale, ubiquitous computing of it operating at an urban and architectural scale, and augmented reality of, of pervasive of, a, of computation at a at the pervasive computation at a perceptual scale. And each of these comes with again with its attendant accident. Cloud computing and, glo and planetary uh, planetary distributed uh, cyber infrastructure, I think, as this as the chart makes makes clear, produces new logics of geographical proximity and distance different than those of this of the of the jurisdictional differentiation of the nation state. It's not that place doesn't matter; it's that it's that proximity around central nodes and and, and uh, uh, does matter, and that it, it reforms uh, reforms the condition of geopolitical access in its own right. But it also produces new kinds of political accidents. This is a this is a drawing from a, a patent that Google filed last year for offshore data centers. With it makes perfect sense that you use the tidal currents and and the available water to keep processors cool and to reduce the sort of load on this as well. It also means that the basic infrastructure of the uh, the basic infrastructure of the planetary cloud ex exists outside of national territorial waters. And as some of the events of the last few weeks, the issue about the geographic, the ge global distribution of information, and the capacity of the nation state to curtail that distribution um, is an issue that we need to better understand. Ubiquitous computing we could define simply as the as the sort of as the set of technologies represented by a transformation from com computate computers understood as a type of object in the world. That's a computer. That's a computer. That's not a computer to computation as a general property of objects in the world, like electricity, in a way. But it also produces, its, again, some of the other kinds of more cultural accidents we can see to fly have to do with the granularity of addressability. IPv6, as we know, as makes uh, a, th a theoretically available address space of something of the order of 10 to, 10 to the 10.8 to 10 to the 23 per person. An incomprehensibly large addressable address space, and one of the, the projects that we're working on is to, in fact, try to develop and account for um, uh, what what that what the scale and and usefulness of a of the of a personal address space that large. Augmented reality we see as a kind of blending of the of the symbolic and imaginary layer by which the interfaciality of the world and the ability to rep visually represent that interfaciality becomes a an actual designable uh, a, a event and part of a and, and part of a visual culture, but it, it comes with its own forms of potential accident. Not the least of which is advertising, but also the kind of, of falling into the kind of of, of uh, solipsism of the of a pre-constructed annotation and adaptation um, um, of a, of this of the particular space. So let me talk specifically about some of the research initiatives that we have initiated. And I have to say that we this is this represents about four months of work, um, and each of these is sort of in, in its um, in, in initial state and has its own secondary funding 
sources in, in its own right. But one of the ways we're looking at this is to think about is to use speculative design as a way to um, is, is it a way to develop policy in new kinds of in, in new kinds of ways to hypothesize about what it, hypothesize about what is possible to prototype those possibilities and to understand these um, in, in a bit in advance of themselves. So first, is digital is are, are a series of projects around digital organisms of understanding the physical and virtual uh, hybrid infrastructures and the types of of of, of both uh, individual and collective social forms that are, are that are uh, enabled through these. We've had an, an ongoing project around California high-speed rail, which we are looking at not so much as a train and track design problem, but as an everything else design problem. How the infrastructure will impact cities, how the, how the train can be understood as a, as a rolling data aggregation, sup, da, data aggregating supercomputer of the, of the uh, and, and a series of lo, uh, located media projects um, for this captured audience. It's a project with Intel Research Labs in Portland on the network sensing issue, one with Stamen Design on the visualization of social media in the space, and, and, and a few others that I'm not going to talk about today. Um, we began a project with, um, that is going to be looking at both uh, New Songdo City um, and Mostar near Abu Dhabi, um, and essentially tr trying to um, evaluate and make sense of both of these two li linked but different initiatives in the smart city space, which are also have are trying to also look at a sustainable city. And part of what we're particularly looking at is the ways in which these these particularly closed political systems um, uh, either in both enable and disable the goals around uh, open information and open environment and open um, energy management. Um, we have uh, begun a project with um, uh, 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 the, which we call DEED, not LEED, um, but as, like the LEED standards, of course, is the is a set of guidelines for, for uh, energy and environmental design of buildings. Um, what what, the, what DEED is looking at is how it is that as we develop more smart spaces at a large and small scale, what are the design guidelines we need to look at in terms of understanding information capture? The transparency of the information that's captured, the transparency of the information that is that, um, in terms of, uh, for example, from energy uses of the building, and what essentially are the st are the standards for a democratic use of a smart space that we could put in place and uh, and, and and propose as a set of guidelines for the continued development of this. So this is tied back again with the Mosdar and New Songdo City project as well. So we're using them as essentially as our worst case scenarios. Um, again, on the IPv6, we have a project working with a number of different people, which we call Deep Address. Um, and what this is looking at is with that incomprehensibly large number of 10 to the 23 IP addresses per person, we're asking the simple question of what would you do with that many addresses and how could you possibly fill that up, which brings together questions from bio, the, uh, uh, personal bio, uh, uh, med medicine, uh, ener medicine, energy uses, transportation, object tracking, all the rest of this, and beginning to understand what th what the ultimate, almost existential question of that le that deep level of addressability uh, might might provide for. A number of projects which we which we, call, which we are um, folding under the envelope of what we call Cloud Polis, which had began with a study of the of the um, Google China conflict, and be also goes back to this um, this thing that I showed about the Google offshore data center, and that is how it is that, cl that cloud and planetary scale computing infrastructure um, is produces all kinds of difficult data sovereignty issues. We have a researcher who's now um, in the Himalayas, and she is working with us and a number of other people, but what she's particularly looking at um, in the context of our center is the conflicts over the capturing and distribution of data between India and Pakistan in the Himalayas on, 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 on the ice melting. So there's lots of sensors up there tracking the, mel the melting ice as it moves across the borders. Indians don't want to share the data with the Pakistanis. Pakistanis don't want to share the data with the Indians. Neither want to share the data with the, with, the, with the international bodies. And you're beginning to see an interesting kind of development by which geographical sovereignty is determined. Not, it, it's, it's, it's less like that we control this data because we control this geography, but rather we control this geography because we control the data that's generated there. So, and these kinds of issues of a kind of data generator are, are obviously of enormous interest to us. And last, what we call geoscapes, which is looking at the at the ways in which multiple ge jurisdictional claims, particularly ones that are IT enabled, are made on particular spaces. So we're looking at these kinds of data sovereignty issues, but also even theological claims on space and the rest of this as well. And this is uh, this is an exercise essentially in conceptualizing new forms of maps and geographies. 
Um, I spent uh, quite a bit of time in Russia last month um, meeting with um, um, other centers over there, um, Skolkova and some other things as well, um, as with a project that was sponsored by um, the State Department as part of the Digital Civil Society. Um, initiative. I think we're going we're going back this summer, and I think we're going to be doing some as yet unspecified work with them to extend the, to extend that initiative. Um, we are a node within Cal IT um, for which it's a now uh, quite active design research consortium where we um, are a point of connection um, for other design schools in the area, SciArc, Parsons. Uh, and the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena in particular, um, uh, working, using Cal IT's facilities to uh, work with similar questions. We've got several other research projects in the works. Um, this week we met with Wikipedia, um, and today did a lot of follow-up with them. It looks like we're going to be working with them um, in a number of different ways. Um, the, the, the one I'll mention today is the development of an advisory board around the the internal and external governance issues um, that they're that they're that they're that were they're the fifth largest website in the world, like 50 employees or so, um, with a uh, almost unfathomably informal comprehension of their own governance structures, but one that we see as potentially abstractable to a lot a lot of other kinds of institutional contexts. Uh, later this month, we're launching our blog. We'll have um, now 10 writers who will be working for not just UCSD, but uh, um, around the world, whose research is dovetails with a lot of the things that we're looking at. Um, so that'll be a kind of um, a way to develop the discourse and distribute the research. Um, lastly, I just want to sort of say one, one sort of thing about the way we think about design in this context. Um, design... Um, Design tends to do its best work in relationship to uh, in relationship to crises, emergencies. The big sort of uh, leaps forward uh, hap are, you know, ha happen uh, in relation to these. Um, our friend and colleague here at Scripps, Paul Crutzen, um, has, uh, in addition to not only his work with the with the um, the hole in the ozone layer, but he also was the the fellow who coined the term the the Anthropocene. And his argument is his. Hypothesis is that is that we have so fundamentally transformed the planet through climate change and ocean acidification and asphaltization, urbanization, and so forth and so on, that we've entered a new geologic era. The good news of the bad, the, which is probably a lot of bad news. The good news of this is that it proves that it's possible to design a planet because we've done it already. We've done it really badly, but we have redesigned a planet at once. We, we, we could call this the 21st century. So a lot of what we're looking at here as well, just taking on the, the meta-design issue of how do you design political geographies and these kinds of global jurisdictions, um, we, we see the work that we're doing, um, hopefully trying to take it um, um, at, this so, at this sort of level. So let me just um, sort of end with this uh, more philosophical statement, and that is that Deep systemic crises invite three interrelated and apparently oppose, only apparently opposing responses, modernism, inertia, and fundamentalism. Fight, hide, and flight accordingly. Towards this, the Center for Design Geopolitics is, recognizes the emergence of another alternative modernity, where industrialization provided heaviness, contraction, sub, uh, heaviness, expansion, production, and consumption, our successor modernity is one of lightness, contraction, subtraction, and restoration. It is an interfacial modernity, not of identity and maximalization, but of externality and transference. Where industrialization was a modernity for tabula rasa, today a subtractive modernity curates a world that is infinitely full. Its radicality is not drawn from the historical or geographic momentum of a new world, but rooted in the precarity of globalization the precarities of globalizations that are is as irresolvable as they are interconnected. Thanks.